Hello, welcome to On Wildlife. I'm your host, Alex Ray. On this podcast, we bring the wild to you. We take you on a journey into the life of a different animal every week, and I guarantee you you're going to come out of here knowing more about your favorite animal than you did before. This week, we're going to take a look at a special group of birds that are found up north in Alaska all the way down to South America. With a lightning-fast metabolism, they have an insatiable appetite and can reach speeds of almost 50 miles an hour. So keep your eyes in the sky and listen for a low hum, because this week we're talking about hummingbirds. Before we start, I just want to say thank you to Ali G from New York for suggesting this episode topic. If you have an episode topic that you want to suggest, you can email onwildlife.podcast at gmail.com. Hummingbirds are an amazing group of birds comprised of almost 400 different species. A flock of hummingbirds can have several different names, such as a glittering, a bouquet, or a shimmer. And hummingbirds only live in the Western Hemisphere, with most of the species living south of the U.S. for large parts of the year. And I say for most of the year because, like many other birds, they migrate. They are the smallest species of migrating bird, weighing less than a nickel. And of the almost 400 species of hummingbirds, only 15 of them live in the U.S. Most of the hummingbird species live within the equatorial belt, which means that they live between 10 degrees north of the equator and 10 degrees south of the equator. And half of all hummingbird species are found in Brazil and Ecuador. Unfortunately, about 10% of hummingbird species are either vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. And two species have even gone extinct. And this is mostly due to habitat loss, but we're going to talk more about that later on in the episode. Hummingbirds are from the order Apidoformes, which means unfooted birds. And while they do have legs, they're tiny, and they can't be used for any form of walking or hopping, but they are able to perch on trees and shuffle side to side. And even though they can't really walk, they're the only group of birds that can fly backwards. But why are they called hummingbirds? Well, they got their name from the low humming noise that their wings make because they beat 2,000 to 3,000 times every minute. That's 30 to 50 times per second. The main food source for hummingbirds is the nectar from flowers, but they'll also supplement their normal diet with insects. This makes them both nectivores and insectivores. They can visit hundreds of flowers at a time to drink their nectar, and the insects that they eat help to add protein to their diet, and they've been observed eating flies, wasps, spiders, beetles, and more. To drink nectar from flowers, the hummingbirds have a specialized extendable forked tongue that allows them to get deeper into the flower. This tongue is different from a woodpecker's tongue in terms of form and function, but like the woodpecker, hummingbird tongues coil around the skull and eyes because of how long they are. In addition to insects and nectar, hummingbirds can actually repurpose holes drilled by other birds, called sapsucker birds, to drink tree sap and they'll steal insects from spider webs. And this is a really high risk, high reward process because they're small enough to get trapped in the web themselves. Hummingbirds need to be constantly eating to stay alive and they can eat up to two times their own body weight in nectar and insects. This is because hummingbirds have an extremely high metabolic rate that allows their resting heart rate to hit 500 to 600 beats per minute and reach up to a thousand beats per minute when they're searching for food. Human hearts only beat for around 80 beats per minute. But hummingbirds are really diverse. For instance, the shape of their bill can be widely different depending on what types of flowers they drink from. To drink the nectar from flowers, the hummingbird's forked tongue automatically separates as it touches the nectar. Their tongues are coated in lamellae, which are these tiny, almost hair-like fibers. As the tongue pulls back, those forks close, and the nectar that was stuck to the tongue is taken into the mouth. Hummingbirds can flick their tongue into a flower at around 18 times per second. But how do they find the right flower to take nectar from? 
Well, they don't have a sense of smell, but they do have excellent vision and can see in color, which is pretty important when dealing with flowers. And many hummingbirds are attracted to bright red colors. You can buy feeders that have nectar in them in order to attract hummingbirds to your own backyard, which is really cool. And the best course of action if you want to see hummingbirds is to plant flowers that are naturally shades of red or orange and to buy feeders that are built with these colors. If hummingbirds can't get enough food and they're quickly losing energy, they can enter a state of torpor in order to save any remaining energy. They can also enter torpor when they're sleeping at night. Torpor is one of the best ways for animals to conserve energy. When they're in this state, body temperatures temporarily drop and the metabolic rate is lowered so that the animal can enter a sleep-like state. Bears, rodents, and some birds are examples of other animals who engage in torpor. And I know this sounds a lot like hibernation, but torpor and hibernation are very different. Hibernation refers to a deep sleep to get an animal through the winter, while torpor is designed to last at most for a few days. When hummingbirds enter their state of torpor, their body temperature drops from 105 degrees to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and their heartbeat will slow down to 36 beats per minute. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we're going to talk about how hummingbirds find a mate. The person that I want to recognize on this week's episode of Notable Figures in Science is Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, who is a marine biologist and climate scientist, among other things. She's well known for addressing how climate change and environmental policies can impact marginalized groups of people. After earning her BA in environmental science, she got her PhD in marine biology. She then became the executive director of science and solutions at the Waite Institute, where she conducted the first ocean zoning project in the Caribbean, which is helping to protect the waters of Bermuda. But her accomplishments don't stop there. She also helped create the Blue New Deal, which helps politicians to add oceans into climate policy. Currently, she's working as the consultant for climate policy at Ocean Collective, where she's trying to figure out new and innovative ways to stop climate change and human impacts on the ocean. If you want to learn more about Dr. Johnson or this series, check out onwildlife.org. Okay, we're back. So let's learn more about the hummingbird's lifestyle. Hummingbirds can live between 6 and 12 years in the wild, and there have been documented cases of hummingbirds living up to 17 years in captivity. And if you're lucky enough to see a male hummingbird, you'll see their bright colors that have a certain shine to them. They use these bright colors so that they can do elaborate dances in flight to attract a female. The females usually have duller colors, as they're the ones choosing the mates and not the males. The most likely explanation for their dull coloration is that it helps them camouflage to avoid predators while they're sitting on their eggs. Hummingbirds are polygynous, which means that the males only breed with the females, and then they leave the female to raise the young by herself. Males will mate with multiple females. And breeding takes place during the time of year with the highest nectar availability, and eggs are laid in nests that are disguised with dead leaves, bark, and moss. These nests can take up to 10 days to build, but they're able to be used year after year until the nest is damaged or if the female hummingbird chooses to relocate. A usual clutch contains two tiny oval-shaped white eggs, but clutches of more than two have been found because some species of hermit hummingbirds will lay their eggs in another female's nest. After the eggs are laid, the incubation process will begin, and it usually lasts about two to three weeks. We've talked about some animals on the podcast that hatch and are automatically ready to be on their own, but this isn't the case for hummingbird chicks. The chicks are born featherless and require lots of care until they can regulate their own body temperature at around 7 to 12 days old, and the mother feeds them for weeks after this time as well. Aside from the mother and her chicks, hummingbirds are not very social animals and will only come in contact with other hummingbirds when it's mating season. 
While they may have to migrate large distances to go to or from their breeding grounds, they make the journey alone. And because they're not social, males and females are extremely territorial and will protect their territory with their lives. These small animals have pretty big territories. Male territories can get to be around a quarter of an acre. When showing aggression to animals that go into their territory, they'll first chirp and chitter at invaders to tell them that this area belongs to them. If that doesn't work, they'll assume a threatening posture and then dive at intruders. This is followed by a chase and more angry chirping to give them one last warning. And after the last warning, hummingbirds will use their sharp, needle-like bills and pointy talons as weapons. They're fierce little animals when they need to be and can seriously injure another hummingbird. One common misconception about birds is that they aren't smart. But time and time again, we see many different types of birds with a surprising amount of intelligence. Hummingbirds are extremely smart. In fact, they have the largest brain-to-body size ratio of any bird. Their brain actually takes up over 4% of their entire body weight. Because of their brain, they have an amazing memory and will remember points of interest based on their territory. They'll recognize every flower and how often they produce their nectar. They can even remember their migration routes down to where they stopped to find nectar feeders. Speaking of migration, hummingbirds can migrate in order to mate, find food, or because the weather is going to be too cold. When migrating, they can fly up to 500 miles at a time and will do it completely alone, as I mentioned before. Their migrations can be up to 3,000 miles round trip. That's longer than the distance from New York City to Los Angeles. While species of tropical hummingbirds don't migrate at all, some of them will move to a different elevation. But the North American hummingbirds often spend their winters in Central or South America, where it's a lot warmer. The longest migration in hummingbirds is found in the Rufus hummingbird. It travels from Mexico to Alaska, which is just under 4,000 miles, and they can survive temperatures below freezing. As we already went over, hummingbirds have an incredible number of specialized adaptations that allow them to survive. They can hover for an extremely long time compared to other birds, and they can dive at speeds of up to 49 miles per hour. They also pee more than their body weight every day to reduce their daily water weight, and this is because they drink so much nectar. Okay, we're going to take our last break, and when we get back, we'll talk about why hummingbirds are so important to the ecosystems that they live in. Okay, it's time for our trivia question. What is North America's only species of big cat? The answer is jaguars. They live in small pockets of the southern United States, and they often come up from Central America and have been found in Arizona. While mountain lions are large cats, just like cheetahs, they aren't capable of roaring, so they're not considered big cats. Okay, we're back. So hummingbirds are extremely important to their ecosystems. Because of their small size, hummingbirds have a lot of predators that will hunt them, such as cats, frogs, snakes, fish, hawks, and even more. There are even some predators that will go after their eggs specifically. In North and South America, the animals that do this are usually blue jays, crows, toucans, and squirrels. The biggest problem for hummingbirds in terms of predation, though, are cats, because they're likely to chase them and will usually maul them without eating them. And feral cats are actually a huge problem for all types of birds. In the U.S., they kill around 2.5 billion birds every single year. But besides being just a prey species for other animals, they're also helpful to the plants. Many plant species rely on hummingbirds to pollinate them, and in exchange, the plants give them nectar. There are even several species of plants that need hummingbirds because they're the plant's sole pollinators. They can also help control certain insect populations, but they faced a huge amount of issues. In the past, humans have hunted them for their feathers to use in jewelry and clothing or to put them in zoos. 
Unfortunately, neither of these practices were humane, and they contributed to a decrease in the overall hummingbird population. Other ways that humans have impacted hummingbirds is through habitat loss, which gets rid of their food supply. A good way to combat this is by putting up feeders or planting specific flowers, but while placing feeders near your home, it is important to not place them near windows, as it can lead to deadly collisions. Some of the hummingbirds are more resistant to habitat loss and can find refuge in human-modified landscapes. This is seen more often in the tropical species. Another problem that they face is the use of pesticides. By treating garden plants with pesticides, it can find its way into the flower nectar that they drink and can cause some serious damage. Hummingbirds are a beautiful species to observe, and if we keep taking away their food and shelter, then more species will join the extinct list, and they won't be able to be enjoyed by future generations. Luckily, there are some great organizations that are helping hummingbirds that you can go support. The Hummingbird Society is a nonprofit group dedicated to encouraging the understanding and conservation of hummingbirds all over the world. They were formed in 1996 in Arizona and spread information about hummingbirds and how to protect them along with their habitat. The American Bird Conservancy is a nonprofit group that protects wild birds like hummingbirds and their habitats all throughout the Americas. And Operation Ruby Throat is dedicated specifically to study ruby-throated hummingbirds and their behaviors. They rely on information supplied by everyday people who live in the United States, Mexico, Canada, and Central America so that we can gain a better understanding of ruby-throated hummingbirds. Thank you so much for coming on this adventure with me as we explored the world of hummingbirds. You can find the sources that we used for this podcast and links to organizations that we reference at onwildlife.org. You can also email us with any questions at onwildlife.podcast at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Instagram at on underscore wildlife or on TikTok at onwildlife. Don't forget to tune in next Wednesday for another awesome episode. And that's On Wildlife. On Wildlife with Alex Ray. On Wildlife provides general educational information on various topics as a public service, which should not be construed as professional, financial, real estate, tax, or legal advice. These are our personal opinions only. Please refer to our full disclaimer policy on our website for full details.